This is CBN News Watch. We begin in Israel where the Israeli Defense Forces say they're making substantial progress in their goal to destroy the Hamas terrorist infrastructure in Gaza, as they also close in on a key Hamas terrorist mastermind. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the ground offensive is racing against international pressure for a ceasefire and the rescue of the more than 130 hostages still in the hands of Hamas. Israeli military spokesman Daniel Hagari says IDF forces have broken through key defensive lines in Jabalia, Shajaya, and Khan Yunus. The terrorists are now emerging from underground and are fighting against our forces in face-to-face -face combat. Our forces are winning and have the upper hand. IDF forces also uncovered one of the largest weapons depots yet found inside Gaza. The weapons include hundreds of RPG missiles, dozens of anti-tank missiles, and long-range missiles that can reach central Israel. The weapons were located in the heart of a civilian neighborhood. On Wednesday, the IDF showed how Hamas launched a rocket from inside a humanitarian zone. It misfired, but the IDF says it's another example of Hamas using its population as human shields. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the IDF has surrounded the home of Sinwa, the Hamas leader in Gaza. So his house is not a fortress and he can escape, but it's only a matter of time before we get him. Netanyahu also reached out to the Red Cross on behalf of the hostages. We exert the pressure to allow the Red Cross to visit our abductees. Further to that, today I spoke again with the president of the Red Cross and told her to turn to Qatar, which has been proven to have leverage on Hamas, and demand the Red Cross visits to our abductors and, of course, the supply of medicine for them. The released hostages and hostage families met with Netanyahu, who are now testifying of Hamas' sexual abuse, both on October 7th and the time the hostages were in captivity. Doctors also verified Hamas drugged the hostages during their release to make them appear happy. On the eve of Hanukkah, the Israel Antiquities Authority revealed never-before-seen evidence of the time when the Greek ruler Antiochus Epiphanes conquered and ruled Jerusalem. I am holding in my hand an object that, for me, is one of the most exciting things we've found in the city of David. These 16 pieces of ceramic roof tiles, unique to Greek culture, provide evidence of Greek presence in Jerusalem more than 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists found these tiles in the Gavati parking lot excavation that verify the time when Judah the Maccabee purified the temple and one day's oil lasted for eight days in the miracle of Hanukkah. So that is what really excites me, because after 2,100 years, we can physically return to the events of Hanukkah. And Chris is with us now from Jerusalem. Chris, as Israel prepares to celebrate the biblical holiday of Hanukkah and the Israeli Defense Forces closing in on Hamas's Gaza chief, Yahya Sinwa, how close are they to capturing him? Well, we don't know how close exactly, Mark, but we do know that they clarified, actually, after Benjamin Netanyahu made that statement, that they don't know if, exactly if uh, that was the house they were surrounding. They do believe that he's in Khan Yunus, uh, and they, they, but I think the sense they have is that he's getting, getting close to, to uh, finding him, running out of room. People are going, have gone from north to south, and uh, right now the IDF is filling up the tunnels with, uh, with water from the uh, Mediterranean Sea. He's obviously the number one wanted uh, on the uh, Israeli list. They've eliminated a number of top Hamas officials already. Uh, and on that note about Hanukkah, Mark, you know, it's really coming at an important time for Israelis and Jews worldwide. The lighting of the first candle is, uh, is tonight. It's a story of hope and victory. And uh, Jews worldwide and Israelis here, they need both of that right now. Yeah, definitely a boost for them. The IDF also says terrorists are coming out from underground. How much progress is Israel making against Hamas in this latest offensive, Chris? Well, they seem to be making a significant uh, uh, progress. And I said they were flooding the tunnels 
They've destroyed at least 500 of these tunnels. And that large weapons depot we reported on in our story, uh, you know, it's incredible how woven Hamas has been inside Gaza. It's really one large military base. You have weapons in and near schools, mosques, homes, uh, everywhere. But uh, the IDF is making significant process. And as we said in the uh, intro, Mark, you know, they're really racing the diplomatic clock and how long they can go ahead with this offensive before the international pressure, and particularly from the United States, gets too difficult for them. So, uh, but they're making progress uh, day by day. The Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant told ABC News the war will continue at its current intensity for two more months, followed by months of mop-up operations taking out pockets of terrorist resistance. Is that what you're hearing as well, Chris? Uh, we are, Mark. Uh, the timetable that Gallant says may be ex setting expectations uh, low in terms of that, and that, uh, that if they're done earlier, it's certainly going to look good for Israel. Uh, and still this tension between Israel and the Biden administration about how long they can go on this. So obviously his statements, he's putting out that two months uh, timetable. Uh, the UK ambassador said a few days ago that uh, for Israel, he said, remember Mosul, it took months and the US didn't have a timetable on their military campaign. Uh, but we are hearing that after the war is over, Maybe they should, uh, it, people are expecting an insurgency with the terrorists going underground, blending in with the population, uh, similar to what happened at the end of World War II when Nazis sort of blended away and tried to either escape or be some sort of uh, in, insurgency. There's word Netanyahu may face a political challenge from within his party. What do you think could happen? Well, probably nothing before the war is over right now, but there are talk of challenges from two Likud candidates. One is Danny Danone. He's the former uh, Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. The other one is Nir Barkat. He's the former mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, and there's, there's talk right now that probably there'll be oppositions that they will come against Netanyahu within the Likud uh, primaries. And uh, so there's going to be a lot of political machinations uh, when the war is over. And right now you can see some people jockeying for position. Uh, a lot of people have said, you know, if Netanyahu wasn't the head of Likud, there would be a larger government. But we'll see how these uh, opposition and challenges go on when the war's over. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland says the Justice Department is investigating the deaths and kidnappings of Americans during the Hamas attack on October 7th. What is the U.S. doing about that? Well, it looks like they're going to invoke a little-known war about the mistreatment of Americans during the war. This is certainly welcome for Israeli Americans. Uh, the number of that are, that are in captivity and the number that have been killed. Uh, some are wondering over here, uh, what took them so long? And uh, because uh, that was very noticeable at the beginning. There were not only a lot of Israeli Americans, but a lot of nationals from different countries. But a, a welcome sign for those that Israeli Americans that uh, would like the U.S. government to be supporting them. All right. Thanks as always, Chris. Remember that many people are praying for you guys, our entire CBN News team in Jerusalem. Keep up the great work. We appreciate it. Coming up with anti-Semitism flaring up on American college campuses, a group of 20 state attorneys general wants the federal government to take action. We're going to bring you that story when we come back. Since the Hamas attacks on October 7th, anti-Semitism has been on the rise in the U.S., especially on college campuses. Now, as CBN's Brody Carter reports, a coalition of 20 attorneys general is calling on the federal government to revoke student visas for those who endorse Hamas or other terror groups. <laughs> that are here because we allow them to be here. And if they're gonna engage in this sort of support of terrorists, we need to get them out of here. 
The letter, written by Arkansas Attorney General Tim Griffin, calls on the State Department and Homeland Security to, quote, vigorously renew vetting of foreign student visa holders and promptly remove anyone who has endorsed or espoused terrorist activity or provided material support to foreign terrorist organizations. I would say most of them also don't support terrorism. Most people who are here on a student visa are here to study um, and to learn about American culture. But those that are supporting terrorism shouldn't be in our country. Iowa's AG Brenna Byrd also signed the letter. It's even more concerning when I hear uh, students on campus say that they're scared, they don't feel safe because of what is going on there. In 2022, the federal government issued more than 400,000 student visas, an increase of 53,000 over the year prior. One reason could be the money generated by the student visa program. It pumps about $38 billion each year into the U.S. economy via tuition, living expenses, and other spending. Almost three-quarters of these F-1 student visa holders find jobs in the important fields of science, technology, engineering, and math within three years of graduating. Some call that a huge return of investment as top international talent stays here. These are the universities with the highest number of student visa holders and the dollars they bring with them. USC and NYU lead the way. It often starts on the left and the right coast, and it ends up everywhere. And the last thing we want is for Hamas and Hamas sympathizers to be using the United States uh, in order to plan uh, future attacks. While free speech applies to all students in the U.S., including foreign visa holders, supporting terrorism does not. That's why the coalition is calling on the federal government to act. Brody Carter, CBN News. Still ahead, why one evangelical ministry is encouraging Christians to join Jews in celebrating the biblical feast of Hanukkah this year. We're going to have that for you right after this. Welcome back to News Watch. Shining lights in solidarity with Israel this Hanukkah. On this week's episode of The Global Lane, the North American director of the Friends of Israel explains why the ministry is encouraging Christians to put a lit candle in a window each night of the Jewish holiday. Recent violence against Israel and the increasing anti-Semitism that's been happening across the United States, uh, we are urging Christians here at the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry to light a candle starting December 7th, which is the start of Hanukkah, to show solidarity with their Jewish friends here in the United States. We know many Jewish people feel alone, isolated, and they, they even feel they're questioning who their friends are with the war that's happened since October 7th between Israel and Hamas. And so this is an opportunity for Christians to stand up, say we support Israel and the Jewish people by lighting a candle so that they can see visibly the love that's coming from that house. So this year, Hanukkah runs from sundown on the 7th through December 15th. So tell us about the significance of the Jewish holiday. What can you tell us about it? A lot of Christians don't know about it. Yeah, Hanukkah, I always like to say this, Gary, uh, Gary you don't have Christmas without Hanukkah. Uh, you need a Hanukkah story to get to Christmas. And even Jesus himself celebrated Hanukkah in John chapter 10, verse 22. It was called the Feast of Dedication. But uh, Hanukkah is all about the festival of lights. And that's why it's important for us. That's why we want, we want Christians to light a candle in their in their window. It's because it's the idea of, of light, uh, bringing light. You know, the idea of Hanukkah was that at one point in history, the Greeks wanted to rob the Jewish people of their identity, to steal it from them. One particular Greek king, Antiochus Epiphanes, wanted to take away Jewish identity. He wanted to rob them of their Torah reading, the, Sab the, the honor of Sabbath, uh, going to synagogue. Even the temple was desecrated. And so really the, the story of Hanukkah is the story of the Jewish people maintaining their identity in the face of assimilation into Greek culture. And that story lives on even today where the Jewish people are still fighting to maintain their identity and maintain their sovereignty in the land of Israel. So there's great connection between the story of Hanukkah and the story of what we see mm -hmm. taking place even today. Yes, I mean, not much has changed in over 2,000 years in the time of the Maccabees. So we're seeing anti-Semitism spreading not only here in the United States, as you mentioned, but around the world as a result of this war, Israel's war against Hamas. So how is the Friends of Israel gospel ministry responding? What are you doing? 
Yes, we have what's called our Israel uh, Stand with Israel Fund, uh, where Christians from all around the United States and Canada, really all around the world, have been giving to help support the Jewish people and the people of Israel uh, for a very long time, even before the war. The Friends of Israel has been building bomb shelters in sensitive locations along the Gaza Strip and in the in the uh, northern border with uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon uh, to protect those Israeli families that might not have safe rooms or bomb shelters, or maybe they were sensitive locations like a park or a tennis court where, where, where Israelis were playing along the border of Gaza, and uh, they only had 15 seconds to get to safety. Friends of Israel's built more than 60 bomb shelters in these sensitive locations. Over the years, we've also partnered with Magan David Adom, which is Israel's national Red Cross. Uh, and so we help supply, especially during medical emergencies like the one that you're seeing right now with the war. So we've been supplying funds for them for quite some time. We actually just did a Giving Tuesday fund to help them raise a Metabike to help the, uh, a, a volunteer or a medical uh, a professional get to somebody who's injured on a, on a moped that's fully stocked with medical equipment. Um, and so we were successful in doing that. And we continue to minister to our Israeli friends through the various outlets that we have uh, uh, um, through our church plants and through believers who are on the ground in Israel ministering to Israelis, uh, especially during the war. Wow, you're doing a lot. And quickly then, Chris, lighting candles is an important display of solidarity. But what about once the candles are extinguished, Hanukkah's over? What then? What can people do to help Israel and Jews during this trying time? You know, I always think it's important for Christians to let their Jewish friends know that they stand in solidarity with them and that they support the state of Israel. Uh, I think it's important for a Jewish person to know that they feel safe around their Christian friends, uh, because this is definitely trying times. So if somebody feels as though they are being supported and they don't have to question whether or not uh, uh, they should be scared uh, to have a conversation about Israel or whatever. This is an opportunity for them to feel safe. So reaching out, uh, extending your hand and saying, I stand in support of you is a great way to show solidarity to the Jewish people during this very difficult time. Okay, Chris Katolka of the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry. Keep shining your light. We appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. God bless you. Thank you, Gary. Also in this week's episode of The Global Lane, countries pledge to return to nuclear power at the Global Climate Conference in Dubai. And follow the money, a look at the sources funding the rise of anti-Semitism on, <coughs> excuse me, on U.S. college campuses. And you can catch The Global Lane tonight on the CBN News Channel at 8 o'clock Eastern. You can also see it on the CBN News app or on YouTube. Coming up on a lighter note in today's troubled world, we're going to find out how penguins, <clears throat> excuse me, have solved the riddle of getting newborns to sleep when we come back. Stay with us. CBN News app, one place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Get the CBN News app today. It's a struggle new parents are all too familiar with, getting enough sleep with a newborn around. But penguins in Antarctica seem to have it down pat. Take a look. Researchers say chinstrap penguins must guard their eggs and chicks around the clock. And that means thousands of mini naps a day. And these so-called micro sleeps, they last only about four seconds at a time but they add up to around 11 hours a day, allowing the penguins to provide for and protect their babies. I'm not sure a micro nap would work for a human being. Well, that's gonna do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel anytime or online with cbnnews.com. Also, tell us what you think about the stories you've seen by emailing newswatch at cbn.com. You can also talk to us on social media. Hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.